Ladies and gentlemen, players, coaches, I'm delighted to have with me today Lee Cannaville. First, you mate, thank you for joining us. Really You're welcome. Appreciate it. Uh, Cannons, I had the privilege to play with you, uh, but please tell the audience about your playing career. As a professional football player for 12 years, um, I started my professional career at Arsenal Football Club. So when I left school, when I left high school, I signed a one-year, what was then a YTS form. So that was literally a year to get to know what you're doing and playing in the youth teams um, and things like that. And then after a year, on my 17th birthday, they signed me on a three-year professional contract. So at that time for me, it was you know, amazing that nice. I'd become a year at Arsenal and a three-year deal. Um, but then really was when the hard work obviously started. So... For those who may not have known, this was going back in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was at Arsenal. So the, the players there were, you know, the, the top draw. So it was always Arsenal and Manchester United were the, the top two teams. So um, brilliant for me at the time to, to mix around with those players and try and break down the doors to get into the first team, which obviously, as anyone can imagine, at young at young age was quite difficult. So I ended up making my debut at 19 for Arsenal. Um, was unable then to continue to break through. So most of my rest of my time at Arsenal then was reserve team football. Um, but it allowed me to go out on loan. So I went out on loan to a club called Northampton Town. Um, and then at 21, I ended up leaving Arsenal um, and played then a bit lower down in the divisions in England. Um, teams like Torquay United, Northampton, Shrewsbury. And then I finished my professional career at um, Notts County, so where I live now in Nottingham, um, and then started playing semi-professional football and went into some um, coaching that I do now. Obviously, I know we're probably going to be speaking about that as well. And then, uh, and then joined some other teams and obviously met you as well, mate. So uh, love yeah. it, love it. So I know your highlight of your career was probably meeting myself, but you mentioned that Arsenal uh, back in the day was one of the best football clubs in the country. If you can, mate, give me uh, give me a few names of the people that were in that squad when you were there. So um, when I was there, it was um, Henri Thierry Henri was obviously the main striker. Dennis Burkham, Patrick Vieira, Tony Adams was the captain. Uh, Robert Perez, Ashley Cole. Um, you know, so superstar, superstar players. Um, oh, yeah. And it was, yeah, it was training with them and, you know, and, and all those kind of things, as you could imagine, was, was tough days. But I was 17, 18 at the time, you know. Um, so to get go up and train the odd day with the, just with the first team was always a test in itself because uh, the training was so sharp. And at the time, obviously, Arsene Wenger, his training methods were everything was done quick with a ball. Possession was a big thing. You know, so you have to be really, really on it in training because if you gave the ball away, especially in the possession sessions, it was hard to get it back. Um, yeah. you know, so it was, so you had to be ready just to train, you know, every day. You had to be in your top condition and mentally, you know, ready to go, basically. Of course, of course, mate. Yeah, so as said, those, those names that you were just dropping there, they're just what people dream of being like, aspiring to be, playing alongside... It was just an absolute honour for you, which is it's brilliant. To, as I said, it's brilliant to have you here, mate. So um, those names are crazy. Um, but I'm going to have to ask you, if you could pick your Dream 5 team, what would it be? Give me it. Dream 5 um Oh, uh, right. Goalkeeper. Um, Neuer. I'll go with Neuer in goal. Yeah. Uh, you've got to go with a bit of flair, haven't you, in a 5 side? So Don't you, mate? You've got to have the sauce in there. Yeah, I would say as a defender, probably the best around at the moment, you've got Van Dijk. So yeah. you've got a defender in there to make sure you don't concede any goals. Um, then I would probably go with Zidane. Yes. Ron Rio, um, and the original Ronaldo. Yes, love that. That's funny. That's <laughs> funny. A lot of uh, these young players right now that are listening to this and maybe players' parents are unfamiliar with the original Ronaldo so ladies and gentlemen if you have time look up Ronaldo uh, the original Ronaldo he is an absolute beast he's a talent um, which 
it's not just that Ronaldo anymore. There's obviously Cristiano, which everybody is familiar with. So it must be that name. So if you're probably trying to think of names for a uh, successful kid, probably Ronaldo might be the one. Uh, Canners, you uh, you played and got scouted for Arsenal, as you mentioned. Did you change anything in your approach to your game to get that call up, to get that step up? Um, I don't know if I've changed anything. I think I just realised how important what I was doing was right, if you know what I mean. So I was quite lucky, I suppose, that I was maybe doing some right things anyway. Um, when I got to Arsenal, I realised how important your... Um, your desire and your attitude and your, you know, your mental strength, if you like, needed to be. So no matter who you are, you know, obviously I trained and saw some of the best players in the world at the time, how they prepared and how they, you know, dedicated themselves to what they were doing. So for me, it made me really realise, you know, that your your preparation to before training, you know, um, your after training how important it was to then go and work on things you know like your core work and your strength and you know even when training's done if you've got a weakness in your game you had to you know you had to go and make sure you improved on that and it wasn't just oh well you know I'll try again tomorrow it was there and then so um, I think leading up to sort of if you like being signed for Arsenal I was always very good at um, preparing well and working hard you know and practicing um, and then being at Arsenal just made me see me thinking I was doing well at it, I saw actually the best of the best doing even more than what I did. Um, you know, so the likes of Henri, watching him after training, practicing his shooting, coming off the left wing and practicing curling it in, you know, and he'd he'd have, you know, bags of footballs with him and he'd just be non-stop practicing after training. And he was the best in the, probably the best in the Premier League at the time. And he was still there after training, practicing and practicing and practicing. So it made me realise how important that side of the game was. Whereas, Growing up, because I was quite talented growing up, it was at the time thinking I can probably get away with things sometimes. Um, and looking back now, when I went to Arsenal, thinking, wow, I wish I'd have probably done a bit even more. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So it definitely gave me a big insight into how good some of these world class players were. Yeah, that's that's brilliant to hear, mate. We've, uh, as I said earlier, I've done a couple of interviews now with pros, ex pros, and the common trait that these boys are saying is that hard work and desire is is a massive key and a massive part yeah. of, of your game that if you want to make that step up, not just pro, if you want to make that step up to try and compete to be a yeah. team captain or make your high school team or go and play for the academy, that is a massive key area that people probably always look back and wish, oh, you know what, I wish I spent 15 minutes after practice working on free kicks or I wish I did 10 minutes running after or I wish I did a few more weight room sessions. Um, so it's, it's, it's always nice to hear, and we, we've touched this before in our mental development sessions with our players, is that you've got to control the controllables. And I know it sounds like a repeated record when we say that to our players that are watching these interviews, but we want to really express how important the hard work and desire. It's such a not just a, a young age, but even younger. And even if you've started soccer at 12, 13, that, that key area that you can control is so influential on the outcome of your pathway that, you, that you've set yourself. Yeah, and, and it is. And I know what people probably think, and kids probably hear it all the time, you know, you've got to do, you should be doing this more. You should be, and I can understand it and they probably get bored of it, if, if you know what I mean. But everyone says the same thing. And it, it, and it literally is that. It's sacrificing certain things. Um, you know, I, even when I was younger, I remember when I was 13, 14 and some of my mates are going out on a Friday night and, you know, and hanging around together. And I had football training that night. There was nothing getting in my way of football training, you know. So, again, when I talk about things that I was probably doing without realising, um, I could have been maybe swayed the other way. Yeah. Um, to think I'm training tonight. I can just go with my friends. One week won't matter. But it was, for me, it, nothing got in that way. Um, that was what I wanted to do. Um, so I think that is so important and I believe I got to that level in the end even though it was hard to sustain that level and be, become that Premier League continuous player um, it was still to get to that stage was definitely from my younger age just being really dedicated to everything was about football yeah. and and what I wished I'd have probably known a little bit more maybe with the education which I'm sure you guys give now which 
kind of when I was younger wasn't really around as much was the outside of the football side so not just with the ball you know without the ball the getting the strength work getting the core work done getting the balance work done um whereas when I was younger it was just the ball with the ball and that was it you didn't really know much more about the other side um so even for what we do now that's I stress a lot on that with our young players you know of course you've got to be comfortable with the ball you've got to make sure your touch is good sharp you know sharp with the ball but also without the ball you need to make sure you're developing your physical attributes um your, you know your mental attributes as well when things don't go right how can we work on those things so which I got zero of that you know so um so that's where you can see now and help these young players and it's not just about the training at that time it's about outside the game in what you're doing and it's really important and for any young person watching you know it honestly is the most important thing I believe in if you want to make it to whatever level you can be at but whatever level you want to go to that is it needs to be done basically yeah, absolutely, mate. So you uh, obviously you've you've mentioned that you played at Arsenal. One thing that you haven't mentioned, which I'm absolutely uh, standing by, um, is that you represented England. What an honour to represent your country! Um, can you remember when you got that call? What it felt like, and and what you were yeah. feeling, and what you were thinking? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> I, I I played for England under 15s. Um, that was the first call up that I got. So I was in. I know it's a bit different in in America, but yeah. the year 10 in England, you know, so my last two years of high school. Um, so you can imagine playing for England and going back to school the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Backpack on, chin up in the sky. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with, um, I do, I, I got the, first of all, obviously the trials had happened and I remember going to the trials and just thinking, I'll see how far I could get because obviously locally I was known to be quite good. Um, but nationally, you don't know how good other kids are out there. So I remember going to the trials and just thinking really to myself, I'll see how far I can get, you know, and see how good I am against these other children from different parts of the country. Um, and then obviously next stage got through, got through, and then got into the final 16 and got, um, you know, obviously picked for the squad. Um, and in that under-15s group, we were to play eight games that season. So it was a squad to play eight games for England. and. It was against the nation, so Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland was three of our main games to see who the best was in the UK. Um, and on top of that, we played Spain, we played France, we played Brazil. Um, I'm losing now. I think we played Czech Republic. Um, so we played some, you know, some really good countries and games. Um, so it was a, it was a massive honour. It was a huge honour to walk out for the you know, stand there for the national anthem and, you know, the England badge. And we got a cap, you know, our England cap that we did. Um, and that just made me hungry for more. It didn't make me think, oh, I've made it or, you know, or anything like that. I was obviously still a boy at the time. I was only 15 and it just made me want more. So the year after I signed for Arsenal, after that, I got into the England, England under 16s. I've, as to playing for Arsenal, I went to England under 18s. And also the England under twenties as I was getting older, so it was a massive honour, a massive honour. And to play against some players now that obviously became huge names, and I played against them for their countries was also a massive honour. Yeah, yeah, that's that's brilliant. As said, that's it's a it's a dream that only young boys, young girls would dream of representing your country. You mentioned that you played against some players, but. Kit, is there any players that you remember that you played alongside that have gone on to make it? Or, or just give me a few names that, that you've recognised. Oh, I'll play with them. There. So. Um, yeah, I, I think the main player, the best player I've kind of played with, he was my year at Arsenal, was Ashley Cole. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, I went on to get 100, and 100 plus caps for England. I think the best left back ever. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, growing up with him, saw how good he was. Um, but then how good he became, you know, every time he got into the Arsenal first team to start, it was he just, I think he scored scored on his debut, for instance, you know, so that just proved straight away how good he was as a left back. Yeah. He ended up scoring on his debut. Um, we'll always play brilliant for England in the World Cups and things, you know, so I would say he's probably the best player that I've played with. Um, and when I made my Arsenal debut, he was played as well um, in that game. So, um, definitely, you know, the, probably the best player I've I've played with. Um, 
best player I played against was, I know I just mentioned it earlier, we played against Brazil. Um, in Brazil, we played at the time. We ended up getting beat 4-2, but there was a person who scored a hat-trick that day, and that was Ronaldinho. So he was, wow. yeah, unbelievable. So he was, um, I just remember basically uh, just how good he was. And we played at the time for England, we were playing three at the back, and I played right at a three um, at the back. And he was playing kind of coming off the left wing. So I got to see <laughs> as much as more than I wanted. <laughs> Probably went for a hat trick, so <laughs> much of him in that game, and um, it was just Brazil at that time. Um, you know, they they seemed like they had twenty five players attacking us at every time. You know, the movement and the pace of what they was doing with the ball was phenomenal. And I think at that time, Ronaldinho had just been sold to PSG, right. so already making steps into his career and. Obviously, I never forgot that him playing because it was like, wow, how you know how good he was. So, um, definitely the best player I played against, um, and gave me a, yeah, it gave me a bit of a torrid afternoon. That <laughs> <laughs> so that's, no, mate, that's that's hilarious to listen to. Like you know, Ronaldinho, a lot of people just see him as a figure and as a name. Um, you had the pleasure. She was a pleasure of, uh, of playing against him. Um, but but Canners, Arsenal uh, at your time had some of the world's best soccer players. How influential was that for you to be alongside as, as a young player? Yeah, um, going in there, obviously I was 16 at the time, so to, to, to go into that environment, um, it was at Arsenal at the time, they had still a lot of English players in the team. So, there was people like Tony Adams at the time that was the captain of Arsenal. Um, you had people like David Seaman, the goalkeeper, um, Ray Parler, you know, the really strong English characters. So for any young lads coming in, they were uh, absolutely brilliant. Ian Wright was probably the bu most, bubbly, you know, so bubbly and invited all the young players to get involved in the banter and all those kind of things. So he was, he was great. And, for a young lad coming in, especially when we got chosen to go and train with the first team, they were brilliant because they looked after the young boys. Um, as the years went by, things changed and less English kind of big players were there. But the likes when I was there was always Tony Adams, who kind of was, he kind of ran Arsenal. He was Mr. Arsenal, you know, and I was actually his boot boy in that first year. So I used to clean his boots. <laughs> so we had a nice relationship, really, where he was interested in how I was getting on. Um, always obviously made sure his boots were clean uh, <laughs> kind of things but it was kind of a nice relation because at the time I was a defender obviously he was the captain and the, the main man at Arsenal was a defender yeah. um, but there were some huge you know huge characters huge people at the time and then as the years went on and um, they bought Henri you know Thierry Henri was bought and then Dennis Burkamp was already there and Mark Overmars was the left winger and he yeah. got sold to Barcelona and they brought in Robert Perez um, Emmanuel Petit, uh, Sol Campbell then came, you know, and um, it was just a, yeah, a, a phenomenal period of, of players and you didn't realise or I didn't realise how good they were until you trained with them. You knew that obviously they were world class, but you saw the pace and the power and the, the touch and, you know, and possession I remember my first session doing a possession session in that group and it was I was you know it was <laughs> quick seen, yeah. the pace of the passing the touch and you know it was like I said earlier you had to be 100% ready to train you know there was no doubt being a bit tired today or you yeah. know because you get found out straight away so um but they were brilliant. They were brilliant with the young boys. They never made you feel nervous, you know, even though you would, you are anyway. But uh, at that time, Arsenal were the, you know, like I said, it was them and Manchester United. They were the best two teams in the country by a mile. And it was, it, they pushed each other to be even better all the time. So it was brilliant to be around, even though it was on my side, it was all about getting into the first team, you know, because you want to, you know, progress your career. Um, so it's great to be around the players, but it was also very, very hard to, break into that team obviously yeah. yeah I mean that obviously only did wonders for your own game yourself like you say you it wasn't just games that you had to be prepared for you you just prepare yourself to walk into the training ground so that always pushes you to the next level to develop your own game to find a way of how to get that success in that environment which like you say it's at the top of the top but Canners um, Arsenal it's a huge club that 
you dream of playing for. Um, at the time, Wenger was the gaffer. Um, what was that call like when you got called up for your first team debut? I remember it was a night game, um, and I think it was the day before, and um, it was at Highbury, obviously different to now. The Emirates, obviously, is a stadium now, but when I was there, it was high, we played our home games at Highbury, and it was... Um, I remember them saying, you'll, you know, basically it was Pat Rice, who was Wenger's assistant, came up in the canteen. We'd just finished training um, and he came up and said, um, just basically sat down with me while I was having my lunch and just said, you'll be the first team tomorrow. we we'll, um email you the details. I was like, OK. Uh, <laughs> like that was it. Yeah, email you the details. So... Um, I remember obviously just then getting that email, what time to report, you know, what to wear, you know, and all those kind of things. And because it was a night game, we we met up early. You meet up at lunchtime still. So even though it was a quarter to eight kickoff in the evening, you meet up around lunchtime um, at a hotel. You go for some, you have your lunch. So you all eat together as a team. Um, then you have your lunch and you go to your room. You get a room each, um, go and have a nap, an afternoon nap. Um, then get up and meet downstairs and go for a walk. So we literally went to a walk around North London. It wasn't a secret place or anything. It was <laughs> like the hotel, a quick walk around. Um, and then you come in and stretch. So Arsene Wenger makes you go into this room and you do your stretches. Um, and then you have a bit more pre-match food, um, team meeting, and then you make your way on the coach to the ground. Um, and that was it really. And so that was the build up, which was great because it was for me, even though you were prepared for games and you, I had night games before, it was this was important. Obviously, this was the first team, you know, and you knew Pybury was going to be um, packed with the fans and everything. And so on the game, I remember going into the change rooms and my shirt was there, you know, which is the first time I'd seen that. Uh, my squad number was number 40. So it was seeing my shirt and you got an option. Do you want to wear, well, just out was long sleeve and short sleeve, two of each. So four shirts just there. Um, so one, obviously, if you wanted to wear long sleeve first half, you could wear another one at half time, swap over or vice versa. So you just did what you wanted, basically. Um, and I was, I was sub on the day. So I never thought, I'm thinking I might not get on, but it was just the whole experience. And I remember getting on, um, warming up. And it was Pat Rice that called me called me down while I was warming up so I knew obviously I was going on and the nerves and the you know, <laughs> and, um, I just remember just thinking like oh my god I just need a all I remember thinking when I was running back jogging back knowing I was coming in was just get a good first touch you know that's all that was going through my mind just have a good first touch but when that ball comes you just make sure your touch is good enough and um, that's all I remember thinking um, and actually when I came on I, I did okay we ended up losing the game 2-1 though which was unfortunate but um, I remember just after that game, just being on cloud nine, it was yeah. the best feeling ever. Yeah, best feeling ever. And um, it was, yeah, probably that was the best, probably best day, best game of my life that was because it was, I kind of achieved something I wanted to, I wanted to play for Arsenal mm. and the first team. You know, I'd done the England, I'd done the England youth set up, I'd done the reserves, I'd done the youth team. We'd always had a very good youth team, so we'd done well in the youth cups. You know, and those kind of things. So the next kind of thing I needed to achieve for me was you need to play in the first team. So it was a dream come true, really, you know, and um, an amazing opportunity. Just wish it could have happened more, but it wasn't to be. But, um, but yeah, so any, any advice now with what we do, what I can give to young players to feel what I felt on that, and it doesn't have to be us, it could be another team, it could be any, you know, any team, but to have that feeling on making your professional debut was was amazing yeah was amazing yeah mate that's that's really nice to hear it's i can picture it right now a little camera yeah. out the wing smile on his face getting ready yeah. to jump on for yeah. arsenal but mate you've had a you've had a great successful pro career um a really good career uh, i was going to ask you if there was any game that stood out um it sounds like your debut was pretty special but is there any other game that stood out to you or would you say that that one is the top of the pile the, the I would, uh, yeah, I'd say that. So even though I didn't start the game, I think just the occasion and the, you know, the like I said, I'd done kind of all the other steps and that was a step that I wanted to 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 do, not just any game, it was just to play for Arsenal. So that was 
that was amazing. Obviously, making the first time I played for England was amazing. Um, you know, that was an amazing feeling. So again, it was a different experience. It was singing the national anthem. It was, um, we played against Wales and we won the game 2-1. And it was, um, again, my parents were there, you know, proud as anything. And it was, it was just a, another a game where it was a bit surreal, really. It was, you know, is this really happening? I'm, you know, playing for England. It's crazy on Sky Sports, you know, so on the TV. So my friends were watching it at home. And, you know, it was just... You know, as a 15-year-old, it, it was a bit crazy. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I still remember my feeling with that. I still remember, the, the, again, the nerves and the excitement of not wanting to make a mistake, you know, and, and all those kind of things. Again, making sure the first thing you did was trying to be the best it could be. And so it was, um, it was again, another, another, like I say, even now, all these years on, I can still remember, it, not just the game, I can remember the, the thoughts I was having. So, um, so yeah, definitely my Arsenal debut and the first time I, I represented my country is two two massive games for me. Yeah, mate, that's that's it's, I love it. Honestly, I could speak to you for hours about these. It's, <laughs> I love the stories, I love the names. It's it's brilliant. As I said, it's what what boys girls dream of now is making that step in here. You are talking about your experiences and. We're so appreciative that you're sharing it with us. So, mate, you, you've, as I said, you've had a great career um, playing and now you're, you've got a great setup with Cannaville Coaching and um, the, the Bright Futures charity. Can you give us more info on that? Let us know. Tell the audience what that's all about. Yeah, so when I finished playing professional football, I, I um, went to semi-pro, which means then that you literally don't train in the day you train in the you know twice a week in the evening normally so kind of my days were free and um I ended up setting up my own coaching company football coaching company at the time my son um was four at the time so the reason that I was doing it there wasn't much around my local area that did anything for four-year-olds um it all usually started at six or seven for football so I thought as I as you do I'll set my own up so <laughs> So it was, it was literally for, he just started school. So it was for anyone in his school that wanted to come along. I set up a, you know, a, a Wednesday evening session and, um, you know, kids came along and coached them, you know, just on how I've been coached all my life, you know. So it was learning how to balance before you could even try and kick a ball. So I, I had children from, you know, four-year-olds to 11-year-olds. So there's a real diverse group I had and they're all in the same hour at the start. So it really tested me on how I was setting up each little bit. Um, but I just loved it. It was me giving something back and coaching and, you know, helping these children. Like I said, some kids couldn't even kick a ball properly. They'd never really even controlled a football. And then there's other kids who, you know, were able to do all the skills and, you know, were, were quite talented. So... It started from there, really, and I, I built up. I ended up going then doing a um, two evenings a week, um, then doing a Saturday morning, then getting a couple of people involved with me. Um, from there, then it went a little bit more another way where we started working in, in schools. So we started doing PE sessions in schools, um, after-school football clubs, and then we started to uh, do some mentoring. So on top of doing the football, what the teachers liked, what we was doing, especially with some some of the boys and girls who were into football, they saw the engagement that we had um, with some of these children. And some of these children at the time might have been struggling in school behaviour-wise or confidence, self-esteem um, issues that some of these children may have had. So what the teachers found was when they came with us, everything kind of, they got like they got released something and they just felt relaxed and comfortable because they was with someone that, kind of understood on a football and a sports side so that's kind of how that started and it just sort of exploded into um you know getting really busy and we we, we ended up going into more schools more teachers were hearing about what we was doing um around where we were living and um we're now long story short we're, we're working in now 34 schools wow. so working with individual children on one-to-one -one basis is um, one-to-one basis on um, working with the, with their schoolwork and working with them in a sports capacity. So um, that's kind of where we are as a company now. I'm also a founder of a charity called Brighter Futures Through Sport, which helps finance some of the schools to continue that program. So um, in England, um, I don't know how it is in, in America, but in England, um, 
the government cut quite a lot of the funding for schools, especially to spend on sport a few years ago. So when schools were struggling financially to continue our program, um, I set up my own charity to help finance that program so schools could pay less and the charity could fund some money towards it. So um, there was no excuse then that we can continue the good work we were doing. So, so that charity is designed to help schools um, continue the program. Then Cannaville Coaching can go and run that program and we can see how successful it is. So, so yeah, that's where we are, mate, at the minute. Um, the company also does holiday camps, holiday football camps. Um, we do birthday parties. We do, you know, so lots of different things outside of school. Um, but the main thing is definitely our mentoring that we do. Yeah, yeah mate, that's amazing to hear. Um, like you said, the words we give back, like that's somebody with your, yourselves past the career that you've had, the, the advice, experience, the whole package, you're, you're delivering that to now children that are maybe, like you say, behavior wise, struggling a little yeah. bit. You're bit, giving them that push, that guidance to not just succeed on the field, but succeed in what us as coaches try to do for children to raise their personality, to give them social skills, to make their life become easier. And, and to hear that coming from yourself, mate, it's, it's amazing that you're doing that. So, yeah thank you. it's um for us it's exactly the same it's it's not just we might have a child that's not really into football you know so literally what you just said your, your social skills your confidence to speak to people you know um not just about your sports in the end it's about going into a room and looking people in the eye and being confident that you belong in that room you know and and raising your self-esteem not to feel that you're not as good as somebody else for whatever reason so with especially within our program that we do there's all these kind of things that we work towards um the biggest thing for us is self-esteem and confidence you know so no matter what you're doing whatever sport you're interested in um whatever you're doing whether it's just fitness whether it's another sport um socially so important for us you know and what we're trying to achieve with some of these children and we've had some great success stories and um, we've had some other things where we just couldn't quite engage with that child for whatever reason so you know, but it's like you say, it's just making sure we try and keep doing what we're trying to do, which is the main thing. Yeah, that's brilliant, mate. Um, but Ken, as you, you mentioned that you set your coaching company up with your, uh, you got a son four years old. He's now 12, is it 12? 12, 12. Yeah, he's the Rio, the young Rio. Rio's got a, a bright future ahead of him. Um, for the parents watching this, how influential are parents negatively and positively um, on children to succeed in in the sport that they love it's it's big it's a it's a big thing in my eyes um i can only talk from experience as a parent so when i take my coach's hat off you know and i'm literally rio's dad and that's it and i go and watch him um people are probably a little bit shocked on how i approach that because i don't say a word when he plays um when he leaves the car you know when i'm dropping him off to go into the change or anything we literally do a fist bump that's it um, I, I, I'll say to him, um, go and work hard. That's all I say. I don't give him a rundown on what he's got to do, what he needs to do, you know, anything. He knows what he's got to try and do in that game, you know. So my only thing I, I'll say to him is go and work hard because as much as he still knows that, I just want to make sure that's the last thing that stays in his mind. Yeah. Um, but And that's my, that's my way of doing it. I'm not saying that's right and everyone's got to do it, but... I've seen some parents that you can see and they're giving their, their son or daughter a rundown on what they've got to do and make sure we do this, make sure we do that, do make sure, you know, and by the time that child probably gets out of the car or has been dropped off, it's I've probably all gone out the other side or it's just confusion and then, or then it can turn into panic or anxiety or, you know, anything like that. And um, as long as they're knowing what they're meant to do and they're working hard and their attitudes are good, then my view is go and let the children play um, after the game. Give them the positives in what they've done. Give them the things they can try and do better. But it's never a negative. It's what you can do better. Um, and that's the best way you can do that, in my eyes. You know, so I've been quite blessed in a way, I suppose, where Rio is, you know, he's, he's a talented lad. But um, people always kind of say, oh, he, you know, he's going to be a professional. Or, but it doesn't work like that. It's... You know, there's lots of obstacles and hurdles in the way that can change direct, change that person's direction. So, 
Um, the main thing when they're, you know, especially if you're looking in the early years, going up to probably the age of 14, 15, the kids have to have a desire to, to, to want to do it. And the main thing by them wanting to do it is that they're enjoying it. Yeah. So the enjoyment goes, that they could be the most talented kid in the country. But um, I think it's a parent's role to make sure their children enjoy what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mate. So uh, go going uh, alongside the Cannibal coach, and you've coached some um, top talent in England. What makes them kids stand out to you that go on to succeed in that career in that pathway? Um, work rate, um, probably the the biggest thing. Um, obviously, talent because you know if you haven't got talent, you can only go so far. So that's that's obvious. So you know the kids that have that I've seen have gone on to, you know, good things and big things have been, obviously been very talented, but their attitudes and their work rate has been phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the main thing I stress to any kids I coach, if I'm doing private sessions or anything is, you know, if we're doing an hour session and I've got one of the most talented kids in the country, he's trading just as hard as someone who's just beginning, you know? So it's not a, oh, well, they're good, we can have a, we can take it a little bit easy, or she's good, we can take it a bit easy. It is, we're going full pace, you know, so, um, so, and they've got to be able to deal with that because that's what's going to happen if they get into the professional game. They're going to be tested, they're going to be booed, they're going to be, you know, all these kind of things. They're going to be told they're not very good, or they're going to be dropped because they've had a bad game. So, hard, hard, hard work, work rate, ability, talent. And also the mental strength to to overcome some negatives that will happen, yeah. you know, which will happen, and they've got to be strong enough mentally to be able to deal with that. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the hardest things, to be honest. That's one of the hardest things, and it's hard to coach that. But the best thing is knowing that it will happen, mistakes will happen, mm-hmm. and it's how you can deal with that. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. There's key words there that you've obviously used. And again, we go back to the controllables and uncontrollables. Obviously, everybody's not as talented as one kid to the next to the next or player to the player. Um, but every kid can work as hard as that kid that is going to go and, uh, go and yeah. succeed into whatever pathway they want to be. Um, yeah. Mentally, Definitely. you talk about the mental side of things. Again, with what we spoke about with the parent side of things, I think that comes as a package as well. Parents can help young players to overcome that. Like you said, you're going to have a bad game. You're going to be dropped one week. You might not make that pass that you wanted to do. Um, you might not make the start in 7, 9, 11 or whatever it is. So I think the whole package of the parents' involvement, influence and the, the player side of things that everybody control. As one, you've got the players that it's down to you how hard you work. But then on the mental side of things, you've got the players and also the parents. Would you agree with that? 100%, yeah. I think, um, and again, I can go off bits that I'm doing with my own son. Um, you know, obviously things that are going on now in the world, you know, I'm, I'm letting him know that he doesn't need to wait for me to go and do some fitness work or, you know, so I'm just dropping that into him to, to make him realise that he's got to be willing enough and want to do it enough to go out on his own and do his work that he needs to do. So whether that's going in his room and doing press-ups and squats or whatever, or going out in the garden and doing some shuttle runs or anything that he feels he needs to do, I want him to start now realising that he's got to take responsibility for that himself. So children can also take that responsibility once you get into those older years, teenage years, and they have to have that if they want to succeed in something. So if they want to be a football player, um, you're going to have to have that self-discipline to, to go out and do the work yourself, you know, and any parents that can give them that helping hand, brilliant. But the children, any children listening, need to make sure they're also understanding that there's no excuses. If you want to be a football player, you have to go and do the work. Sure. And, and hopefully the ones that go and do more than the next child will be the ones who, who have a better chance of making it. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And uh, again, like we, we talk about as coaches, it's not just on the field that we, we try and prep these guys that we're working with and coaching that, to, to bring them success, but also off the field. And again, like we're mentioning about being ready for it, just it in life, like if there's that job and you want to make that job, whether it's on computers, whether it's a car mechanic, if you work and 
drive yourself in the right area, you've got more chance of succeeding um, as, as anybody, really. So yeah. next question for you, mate. Last question. Um, for young players out here, I mean, we've, we've heard a lot, I think, throughout this conversation, we've, we've hit a lot of key areas on this. But for the young players watching this, what advice could you give to them to be able to make that next step up to achieve their end goal, whether it's high school, travel, pro, college, whatever? Um, depending, obviously, on what, what age they are. Um, well, no, I suppose it's any age, really. The main thing is you, pra you practice. Yeah. You know, practice, go and practice with the ball. Um, I would say more for the younger ages in that sense. You know, if you are six, seven, eight, nine, ten, go and make sure you're getting as many touches on the ball as possible. Um, practicing your skills, practicing your touch, practicing, you know, all the sharpness things you can do with the ball. I think as you kind of hit 11, 11, 12 years plus, that's still obviously very important and you need to make sure that's still happening and that's improving. But now the physical side, you need to make sure that's coming a little bit more as well. So uh, my personal opinion is, um, and probably what stopped me a little bit from maybe going on when I look back is physically when I was 18, 19, I was still quite scrawny, quite, you know, um, quite skinny. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have that kind of build and power to, to go into Arsenal's first team and sustain maybe a full season, you know, and that was maybe something that, maybe was put against me a little bit so um, and it was something I knew I could have probably worked harder at you know so I think um, for the children that have got a chance in stepping up the levels practice 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 with the ball but also as you get into those older age groups make sure you're working as hard as you can on the the physical side of the game and I think that's really important that um, the fitness levels are good the power works good you know um, and making sure you can sustain that through for a, a full 90 minutes of, of a game is is so important. Yeah. Um, depending, obviously, on your, your position, if you're a midfield or you're a wing-back or you're a winger, then it's probably even more. So, so you know, <laughs> make, sure, make sure your fitness levels are up there. But the main thing for me is any child that's playing whatever level, enjoy what you're doing, work hard at what you're doing. So I always find that if usually if you're working hard, um, and you're improved, which then me means you're improving. That's so much more enjoyable than kind of emotions and not really getting much out of a session. So um, work hard, enjoy the game, and hopefully push on to your next levels. Amazing, amazing. Well, Cadders, mate, it's been a pleasure having you on board with us today, sharing your career, um, giving that very, very good advice through to players, parents. Um, Always great chatting to you, mate. Um, so, again, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we wish you all the best for the season when it continues with the coaching, with the, the charity. Uh, wish Rio all the best for his uh, career and, and little Jay in as well. I know he's just going to be a superstar, just like his dad. So, <laughs> again, thank you very much. Stay thank safe, you. and I'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, Lee. See you, mate.